Today, we begin a new series on gratitude and being grateful. And uh, this is based somewhat or heavily informed by Diana Butler Bass's book called Grateful. And uh, you can buy some here. We have limited copies, I think about 20 or so, uh, or you can get it online. Um, and it's not one of these devotional books like we just did uh, recently uh, that split into four sections. And each week I'm going to knock out a section and pull out some stuff that I think is cool and see what kind of scriptures float up in my head and talk about those things. But that's what we're talking about today. And gratitude is a really, really popular thing right now. It sounds weird to say that, but it's been popularized uh, because there have been studies done on the power of gratitude in our lives. And so uh, just out of curiosity, have any of you ever kept a gratitude journal? Uh-huh, that's right. It's an industry, right? And out of curiosity, for those of you who have kept a gratitude journal, uh, raise your hand if it was an effective thing for you. Yeah, right. Uh, I've done it periodically. I did it in earnest and still do it very regularly. But when I was on sabbatical, I got this journal made primarily for men because uh, men uh, suck at a lot of things, including <laughs> uh, starting our days off talking about gratitude and getting in touch with our emotions, you know, Guys generally have two emotion words, happy and mad. You know, that's about it. And so every day it takes us through. But it always started us off uh, with gratitude. And it turns out uh, there are some real benefits for that. Uh, so just to give you uh, some look at this, uh, this is the stuff that I didn't have for the early service. And I was bummed because I've got some really rich quotes that I wanted them to see and read because your brain works better if you see it. So this is from Robert Emmons. He's a, uh, he did research on gratitude some years ago. The benefits of gratitude include increased self-esteem, enhanced willpower, stronger relationships, deeper spirituality, boosted creativity, improved athletic and academic performance, and having a unique ability to heal, energize, and change lives. But not only is that cool, gratitude itself actually helps heart health. So another researcher, Philip C. Watkins, he says this, the link between gratitude and the heart is so pronounced, one research team identified gratefulness as a strength of the heart. And some of you might be calling baloney on that, so let me ask you a question. When you have been in the throes of sorrow or stress, did your heart feel pressure? Did you feel a heaviness on your heart? Mm -hmm. And when you have been in a situation where you have been incredibly grateful for some life event or sunset or whatever, did your heart then feel a little bit lighter and open? Mm -hmm. There's something going on here physically. It's not just a mental trick. It is a really, really pronounced thing in our culture. And I gave you a, con or a challenge, uh, an invitation, a woo, a nudge <laughs> uh, earlier this week uh, to start a gratitude list for this whole month. How many of you actually started it? How many of you are still doing it? Thanks to both of you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe today you'll take another shot at that if I can convince you that gratitude is indeed uh, something worthwhile. Whether well, this passage of scripture uh, is a story of gratitude, and uh, this one does not show up in, in Diana Butler Bass's book, uh, but it's super, super good, and here it is. So to give you some context on this, Jesus has finished his Sermon on the Mount, which is kind of his stump speech where he kind of says the main things he wants to say with his life. He heals people, he's doing all kinds of stuff, and then this happens. One of the Pharisees, who is a religious leader uh, somewhere in the northern Israel area, uh, asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Now let me tell you a little about what's going on here. Uh, there's a similar story in the Gospel of John that's very different. It's toward the end of Jesus' life. We know the name of the woman. She was not an immoral woman. So either John ripped this story off and made it his own, or this is the original anyway. We're not totally sure. But what you have here is a woman of ill repute, 
uh, probably not of her own choosing, most likely back in that day and age uh, when she was, I don't know, 12 years old. She did not wake up and say, I want to be a prostitute from this time forward. Probably some terrible things happened to her. And then she was set. Her course was set. And it's like she didn't have many options. And even in being treated terrible, she was still treated terrible. So something happened to her that made this happen. And I think it had a whole lot to do with her hanging around northern Israel when Jesus was doing his thing. Because the main thing that Jesus is talking about is the kingdom of God. And one of the primary things about the kingdom of God, by the way, shalom, kingdom of God, pretty much the same thing. So we talk a lot about shalom around here. When Jesus would go around talking out of his satori experience of his own, seeing everything in a different way, the primary thing that he was telling everybody was God is love, the, the thisness of life, this greater other thing that we believe is there, is most known by love. And that presence, that being, loves you to a person. And you can't do anything to screw it up, but you can sure build a life on it. So all the labels that you have in your world, in your life, when we get our brains around this core reality that we are loved, inherently, profoundly loved, and it cannot change, that can be for every person, and especially a person like this, an absolute game changer. Because if you've found yourself uh, being hurt by the world, by others' choices, or by your own choices, and you feel like a hot mess, not worthy of love anymore, and then you hear this, that has the capacity to change your whole view of yourself. This thing that she's bringing out here, this alabaster jar, this isn't like a $5, you know, small tester perfume that she bought at Ross, you know, on her way to this dinner party. Uh, the jar itself is a work of art and probably had a long uh, white neck, you know, uh, that you would pour this stuff out. And the contents, this pure nard was most likely what it was. And our currency would be worth tens of thousands of dollars. This represented her dowry. And now she is choosing to break off that neck and pour the whole thing right out on Jesus' feet. It is a remarkable uncomfortable scene at a dinner party she was not <laughs> invited to. Extraordinary. Well, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Now, we might look at this passage, we might think, oh, wow, Jesus is a mind reader. Maybe he did that Spock mind meld on him and knew exactly what he was thinking. Or have you ever been in a situation, a dinner party, work, whatever, and you could tell by the look on the face of somebody exactly what they were thinking? That's what we have here. I think the scowl, you know, could be recognized two football fields away, and Jesus and everybody else could see it. Now, hopefully the woman couldn't because her eyes were so filled with tears that she didn't notice. But this guy's got attitude all over the place. He's mad that this is happening. I mean, it's, it's astonishing, right? Well, so Jesus, <laughs> he's going to have a come to Jesus meeting with the actual Jesus right here. So Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon answered, Well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. but She has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. 
And the men at the table said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You know, this is such a weird thing. All kinds of weird happening here. The woman somehow breaks into the dinner party, does this crazy thing, uh, out of complete transformed life kind of stuff. Like, And you've heard these stories, right? Sometimes we hear them in faith communities about a person who was lost and now they're found. That's where the whole song comes from, you know, Amazing Grace. And, and when we hear those stories, it moves us, that our hearts well up, and we're like, this is fantastic. A person's life has been transformed by the goodness and the grace of God. So this woman shows up. She's a known sinner, quote unquote, and she's clearly had her life transformed. She's had her before and after story. And she can't help but just lavish Jesus. This would be one of those moments that as a pastor, you would know this is not the right time to cop an attitude. This is the right time to pull a chair up to the table and say, what happened, my dear child? Or whatever pastors would say to in this kind of a situation. Tell us your story. This is this is remarkable. I don't know what to do with this. But instead of that, the Pharisee has attitude. And it's all over his face. It's unmistakable. And it makes you wonder, what is wrong with this guy? And by the way, when Jesus says, um, you know, people who have been forgiven little, you know, don't show much love, that's not that our way of looking at that is like, well, I haven't sinned that much. So, you know, of course I'm not very, I'm a really grumpy person because I'm just so darn perfect. You know, <laughs> that's not the point. The point of what Jesus is saying is, is that guy is not aware of his own level of need of grace. He's, he's filled with his own pride and his own arrogance, and he can't get beyond the nose on his face to see what's really happening in front of him. It's his pride that's in the way. He's lost sight of the grace of God that's given to him. Uh, Ellie Bizel, uh, who uh, was a Holocaust survivor, I'll talk more about him uh, in a bit, but he had a comment about people with no gratitude. He says, when a person doesn't have gratitude, something is missing in his or her humanity. A person can almost be defined by his or her attitude toward gratitude. It's a fascinating thing. Uh, and it could be that in that day and age, uh, you know, in antiquity, there was a very clear line of how gratitude was supposed to work. In fact, the word gratitude is very specific to a cultural reality, where in a village you would have benefactors who were the rich people in the village, and then you had beneficiaries who were the poor people in the village. Probably they were poor because of the rich people in the village <laughs> who weren't sharing very well. And so the rich people would recognize we need to do something to take care of these poor folk. And so they would provide food, maybe lend money, uh, what have you. And so there would be a, a cycle like, like this. So the benefactor on top would share gifts with the beneficiary, but then the beneficiary was required to show gratitude back to the benefactor. This is a cycle that happened. You can watch a video on this. I've rolled it here twice over the years from Diana Butler Bass uh, called Jesus the Ingrate, uh, about a different story. And she talks about this cycle, which was embedded in Roman culture. And so it could be that when the beneficiaries, uh, when, when they're thinking about things that are happening, people are grumpy when they, even when they receive gifts because they know that the gift comes with something attached. Uh, have any of you ever received something free from somebody and you knew there were strings attached? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, it could be something big or small, but you know that in receiving this thing, it's not free and clear, right? And some of you, when you receive that gift, you even see the person coming with the gift. Maybe it's a repeat gifter. <laughs> and you see it coming, and you're like, where can I hide? <laughs> because you know that to accept this gift, uh, it, is not, it is not just a free gift. I know there have been times in my life where in the receiving of a gift, it sounds horrible, but in the receiving of the gift, which it would be rude not to receive the gift, I have felt both bought and bound and stuck. Anybody ever feel that way? I'm the only one. Okay, that's fine. So maybe that's it. Maybe that's why some people struggle with gratitude and it just doesn't come easy to them. But then in reading Bass's book, I came across another reason which I hadn't even thought of, and it has to do with Ralph Waldo Emerson's quote. This is how he expresses it. He says, It is not the office of a man to receive gifts. 
How dare you give them? We wish to be self-sufficient. We do not quite forgive a giver. Now, the attitude behind Emerson's quote here, which is, you know, in the 1800s, is this, and this is especially true in our hyper-success-oriented, radically individualistic United States of America, where if you just work hard enough, by golly, you can be a success to your wildest dreams. Well, so let's say that's our, that's our ethos that we all live in. That is the cultural reality. And it's for men and women both now, right? Uh, and somebody comes along, and they give you something because they think you could really use it. Well, there could be a part of us that's like, what are you saying? What, you don't think I can provide for myself? Is this, is this charity? And we can even take offense at it. I've had this happen a couple times. It's the weirdest thing. I did not know what to do with it. You need to understand, uh, the family that I grew up in, uh, my mom uh, is the queen, no, goddess of the thank you note. So if you have her over for dinner, uh, she will thank you five times before leaving to go home for a wonderful time and a great dinner. And the following morning, she will send a thank you note <laughs> to thank you, you know, for that meal that she's already thanked you for. And if you send a note back saying, thank you so much for coming, she'll send a thank you note for the thank you note. I mean, it, it'll really happen. Diana Butler Bass talks about this in our culture. So there's this, there's this reality. So there was a friend that I had and, you know, I, I, he, he was kind of in a tight spot in his life and couldn't afford much because he was a student and so forth. And so I wanted to just help him out. And I, I knew that he was kind of interested in something. So I bought him something that I thought he would probably really enjoy. And I was so excited, you know, to give him this gift. And it wasn't a small gift. It was a, it was a you know, decent gift. And I was just, I was so excited to, throw, to, to show him. So I take him out to my car, open up the trunk and I say, I got these for you. And I just couldn't wait to see his reaction. I was like, oh, is he going to give me a high five or a hug or both? This is going to be great. Totally flat. I mean, nothing. I mean, he was like just staring at me and not knowing what to do. It was one of the most awkward silences of my life. And I didn't really connect the dots on maybe what was happening until I read this quote. Like maybe he thought that my giving him this was to say to him, you can't do this on your own. Failure, loser, right? Maybe it was offensive to him to receive a gift. And I raise these questions, and I think Bass raises the question, mainly for us to wonder about this reality for ourselves. Like, what is your relationship with gratitude? Are you a person? I was raised to say thank you all the time, even if the gift was terrible. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, because that was my mother, and that was the environment we lived in, and I think that's been good. But how about you? Did you grow up in an environment where it was easy to say thank you? Because I've run across it many times. It's the weirdest thing for, for me, growing up the way I was. When I see somebody receive something and it is really hard for them to say thank you, just like it was hard for the Fonz to say, I'm sorry, or I was wrong. For those of you who don't know who the Fonz is, well, that means you're young. <laughs> and I am not. So, uh, so there's that kind of thinking about gratitude. But Diana Butler Bass, she goes on and says uh, that there's a different kind of gift that is given, which is an untargeted gift, whereas some of these others are more targeted, where you might feel obligated or, or might feel like almost an insult, like Emerson's getting to. But she said there are, all, there are also these untargeted gifts that we receive uh, that don't really come from one place in particular, even if we name it so. Have you ever uh, driven down the road after uh, a rain and you see a rainbow and you're thinking, oh my God, that, that was just for me. Thank you, God. Have you ever actually said out loud, thank you, God, for that rainbow? All right, I'm seeing some head nods or a beautiful sunset or a mountain vista or the ocean and you're just overwhelmed by it. And sometimes we, we really think that God did this just for us. The whole sunset, just for you, Right. And sometimes we don't want to bring God into it at all, but we still appreciate the gift of the beauty and the experience that is right there. That's an untargeted gift. Diana Butler Bass talks about it this way. We are all untargets of gifts that surprise and sustain us. Untargeted gratitude takes us out of the cycle of obligation into the larger circle of shared gifts. 
beyond reciprocal exchange toward mutual enjoyment and responsibility for those gifts, opening our hearts to the constant flow of receiving and responding that happens all around us all the time and makes us more generous. Uh, Frederick, um, oh, here's, here's a name for you, uh, German theologian Frederick Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher, isn't that a wonderful name to give your child when they're trying to fill out the test? What's your last name, Johnny? Schleiermacher. Can you spell that? No, I can't. So here we have German theologian Frederick Schleiermacher uh, describes it like this, referred to this experience as the feeling of absolute dependence. To him, absolute dependence was not demeaning, it was more like what we describe today as interdependence. He recognized that gratitude was the truest state of reality. Everything exists in an infinite relationship of gifts to everything else. And it was also the starting place for a life of meaning as our own awareness opens toward others, the world, and ultimately God. I have some bad news and good news for you good American folk here today. The bad news is the idea of the rugged individualist who can make it all on his own in our country, that's a lie. Not because of any systemic constructs or whatever, but it's a lie because you cannot do anything all by yourself. You can't do it. You are here today wearing clothes. Thank you. <laughs> you did not make those clothes for the most part. Uh, you ate breakfast this morning, maybe right here at Crosswalk, those delicious donuts, and you did not make those. Those were made by somebody else who used flour uh, from uh, fields that were harvested by somebody else, somewhere else. Uh, the water that you turned on on your tap, you did not purify that all by yourself. Somebody else was part of the mix. You and I are not individuals at all. And what Schleiermacher is saying here is, is when we have this moment of awareness, we really do recognize our, our true interdependence on everybody and everything, that we are no longer separate from the rest of creation. We are deeply entwined with it. We're all one. And when we realize that, it has the capacity to knock us off of our high horse, to think we're all that. And we start to see everybody as brothers and sisters or fellow beings on the planet. That's the Satori moment, when we see the, the unity of everything. When we have those moments, it changes us. It transforms us. And it has the capacity to continue to do that until we get sucked back into the culture which tries to tell us otherwise. Well, um, the unfortunate thing is, is that it's very difficult to stay in that place because life happens. My guess is that some of you are experiencing that even right now. Some of those things I know about uh, what you're going through and some of those I don't know about. Uh, Diana Butler Bast, speaking of other people's things, that uh, choices that have been done to us that have hurt us, uh, she says this uh, in her book, no one should ever feel grateful for sin, evil, or violence. No one should ever express gratitude for the bad choices of others. Those bad choices are never gifts. And the reason she brings this up, because there's this verse in the Bible from Paul that says, be grateful for everything. And Diana Butler Bass, uh, who was sexually molested at 14 years old by her uncle, can never imagine uh, being grateful for that, because that was pure evil. And yet, it doesn't have to be the end of the story. There is the possibility of healing that takes time. It's a process. But if salvation at its root really means to become whole, and if that is God's dream for us, to become whole, then I think Henry Nouwen might be right when he says this. To be grateful for the good things that happen in our lives is easy, but to be grateful for all our, of our lives, good as well as the bad, moments of joy as well as the moments of sorrow, the successes as well as the failures, the rewards as well as the rejections, 
That requires hard spiritual work. Still, we are only grateful people when we can say thank you to all that has brought us to the present moment. As long as we keep dividing our lives between events and people we would like to remember and those we would rather forget, we cannot claim the fullness of our beings as a gift of God to be grateful for. Some of you are too in the, in the middle of it right now. And this just seems almost hostile to you. Almost as if now one is saying, you're failing at this whole thing because you're not getting over the pain that you're going through or went through whenever that was. Diana Butler Bass's journey took over 30 years. It is a process. And honestly, I don't think it can be rushed. It can be nurtured. And we can seek help to help heal the things that are in the way. But it's not fast. I mean, maybe there's like this half of 1% lightning bolt experience that people have and it radically changes everything. But that is so rare, it's even stupid to, to even pretend that we're going to have that. For most of us, it's a slog of working through it. And if that's where you are, if you have past pain that is still with you, I want to tell you, okay, it's there. And that's, that's the human experience and sometimes it really, really sucks. And I'm sorry you're going through it. And I want to tell you, you're loved just the same. It doesn't make you a failure, doesn't make you a bad person, doesn't make you slow, doesn't make you unfaithful, any of that. It means you're a human being. And just inch forward as best you can, knowing that God is with you, loving you, will never change, is always wooing you toward well-being and healing. And that, I, I believe that's true. That's been true in my own life. One of the most insightful books I read many years ago was by Richard Rohr uh, called Everything Belongs. And in this book, he is not saying that God's will was clearly played out in all of your life and everything belongs because that was God's plan from day one. That's terrible theology. But what Rohr is saying is that everything that has been in our life is in your life. It's a part of your story. And even the painful parts are speaking into your life. And until we address those things that are painful, they're going to have more sway over us than we would care to admit and probably cannot see. Even if it's just a 5% thing you've kept tucked away and protected, that 5% still messes with us. And so... You know, the hope is, is that we would recognize that, oh, okay, well, there's this capacity, according to Nowen, there's a capacity to be able to embrace the fullness of our lives in time, and probably that's an ongoing thing that we work on until the last breath that we take. But there's a capacity to be able to look back and just say, I'm just simply grateful for my life. I have life. There were chapters that sucked because of somebody's choices, and there were chapters that sucked because of my choices. But I have life. Diana Butler Bass, like I said, took over 30 years for her to uh, heal from what happened to her emotionally. Uh, when her uncle died, uh, her first words out of her mouth to the person who told her were, thank God, he's dead. Who could blame her? But then over time, uh, and time, hear that again, over time, uh, God wooing her in different ways, her being responsive, her being able to at the moment, at different moments, to be able to take another step forward, and sometimes you just can't. But over time, she was able to get to a different space. Uh, maybe because she started to wonder, she writes about this, like she started to wonder what happened in his life to make him such a monster. What pain was he, was he never addressing that led him to do such horrific acts? And it was in no way him excuse, her excusing him away or saying, well, it's okay now. The evil is still evil. It's not a gift. But something changed in her. She says the thing that changed was grace. And it started to heal her eyes and free her from the burden 
of the pain that he caused. So she says, out of her incredible experience, she says, gratitude at its deepest and perhaps most transformative level is not warm feelings about what we have. Instead, gratitude is the deep ability to embrace the gift of who we are, that we are. That in the multi-billion year history of the universe, each one of us has been born, can love, grow in awareness, and has a story. Life is a gift. When that mystery fills our hearts, it overwhelms us, and a deep river of emotions flows forth, feelings we barely knew we were capable of holding. This is the possibility for us, for all the pains that we've been through, for all the things that keep us from experiencing the fullness of gratitude. It's hope. It's hopeful. Uh, Ellie Wiesel was interviewed by uh, Oprah Winfrey for her magazine. If you're not familiar uh, with Ellie uh, Wiesel, he was a Holocaust survivor, and he... Um, he and his sister and parents, uh, they were born in Hungary. He was born in Hungary. And they took them to Auschwitz. And as soon as they entered the camp, uh, his mother and sister were murdered uh, because they were not going to be good workers for whatever the Nazis had in mind. But because he was able-bodied at 15 years old, and his dad was still uh, able-bodied, they were put to work. Eventually, they went to a different uh, concentration camp where the same thing happened. Um, Eli remembers, or Ellie remembers, uh, his dad in an adjoining room uh, getting beaten and killed uh, because of whatever reason, and the guilt and shame that he felt that he couldn't do anything to help save his dad. It just haunted him, you know, um, forever. Uh, and then uh, five days after, um, uh, after the, uh, the camps were freed, liberated, uh, photos were taken uh, to tell an unbelieving America that the things in the concentration camps that were reported were true. And so if you do a Google search or Wikipedia on Elie Wiesel, um, you can see what he looked like days after that camp was liberated. And he and all of his bunk mates, packed in like sardines, have no muscle on any of their bones. You see all of their ribs. It's a horrific, horrific sight. The atrocities that he witnessed are unthinkable. And yet, Oprah Winfrey asked at the end of the interview, given everything that you've seen and experienced, has it taken away your capacity to be grateful? And his response was this. For me, every hour is grace. And I feel gratitude in my heart each time I can meet someone and look at his or her smile. Friends, you are. That's it. You are. You are. You exist, and you're not alone. You are still fearfully and wonderfully made, even if it doesn't feel like it. Not to minimize our pain and our suffering, but just to remember that life is a gift of grace, that we are swimming in the love of God, and we can never get away from it. That is a true, true gift. So I don't know what's messing with you today. We're going to spend a moment in quiet just to let you listen for that still small voice. This week I focused uh, on section one of the book, which had to do uh, with our individual stories and our emotions surrounding gratitude. Next week we'll talk on the individual level about the ethics that that uh, forms in us, and then we'll take it out to a corporate level. She calls them the we, the we feelings and the we ethics, which, we'll, which, we, which we will get to, and I think you'll appreciate it because it's, uh, it's a really rich book and it's worth your read. But right now, uh, just close your eyes with me, take a deep breath, and be in this moment. There was a lot of stuff put on the screens for you today. Did any of that stick? Or, <laughs> or maybe the teaching was the low point of the day. Maybe it was Brian and Reese just killed it, and maybe there was a song, a lyric that 
you just you can't get over. It's just it's just amazing to you. Or something you heard from Dar in the announcements, who knows? But what is sticking with you right now from our experience here together? Could it be that that thing which is kind of forefront in your mind, could it be that that might be a nudge from God, an invitation in some way to take a step further? And knowing that God's primary characteristic is love and that God's full intention for us is shalom, that we would be loved, that we would be loved, that we would experience peace, well-being, wholeness, connectedness with everybody else, Perhaps that could give you a little extra courage to say yes, even if it's just a half-inch step. So God, I have no idea how you are nudging everybody, but I'm pretty confident that you are a nudger because you love us. Your Spirit of God, con your Spirit constantly calls us forward toward Shalom. So God, may we be receptive. And if we're just in too much pain and agony, may we rest in the assurance that you are the embodiment of shalom itself. God is love. Love is God. We can trust that you're loving us as we are in our pain and our suffering. And one day we hope it might be different. And you'll walk us there when and if it is. So help us rest now and your presence and your love, that we're grounded in a beautiful, bountiful earth and we have a spirit residing within us that is eternal and will last forever. May that give us strength for the day and hope for tomorrow. Toward that end, God, we choose to pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.